And next, I'll turn it over to Sophie. Hi, I'm Sophie Barno. Um, when people ask me what I do, I tend to say field ecologist. Um, I work with SHARP, or the Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program, last summer as a point count technician, um, which we'll be discussing exactly what point count means later in this presentation. Um, uh, since graduating with a degree in ecology and evolution from University of Minnesota, I've been involved with several ecological research projects on a variety of study species, including bats, frogs, birds, and currently plants. Um, I'm working right now with City University of New York at both Queens College and Baruch College as an urban ecology researcher, as well as an adjunct professor in the subjects of ecology and biostatistics. So how did I get into the field of field ecology? It was a combination of influential instructors and just taking notice of the world around me. My spark group was certainly birds. At first, it was 12 year old Sophie asking, what is this bird? Um, and using how the bird looked and behaved to identify it. Uh, but as I grew up the 10 years since, um, I mainly got into asking questions about how birds interact with their environment. Um, when I realized I could ask these questions for a living while spending time outside and observing these species, it changed the game for me. That's what I want to do. Um, and so that's how I landed in the field of research. So I worked with SHARP last spring and summer in the salt marsh regions um, in Cape Cod, including Wakoit Bay. And I helped answer questions about what birds were in the marsh, what kinds of plants were in the marsh, what proportion of the marsh was covered by invasives and more. Um, during today's talk, I'm going to discuss the local research that I did at Wakoit Bay and what we found out. So a huge thank you to SHARP for allowing me to work in this beautiful habitat, as well as to Wakoit Bay for allowing Kate and I, a platform to share our research. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Kate. Thank you. So here's the site that I know all of you lovers of Wakoit Bay are familiar with, Salt Marsh. Um, and just to take a step back and give a scientific definition of it, salt marshes are grasslands that are at the edge of the ocean. So that makes them a really dynamic and unique habitat because they change so much in the course of a day. So in our part of the world, high tide floods the high marsh twice a day. And what that means is if you are a terrestrial or land-based critter, you need to figure out how to live when um, your habitat becomes marine twice a day. And inversely, if you are a marine critter, you need to figure out how to live when your habitat dries out twice a day. And that makes for a really interesting ecosystem and adaptations uh, to the ecosystem. It's a pretty harsh environment really, um, and yet it is very productive. Um, you can see here with many, many birds feeding on the fish trapped in pools, um, they are choked with life, uh, salt marshes. And in fact, if you stack them up against other ecosystems, many people are surprised that saltwater wetlands actually are more productive in terms of generating biomass per unit area than even the tropical rainforest. <clears throat> Again, it is a weird, unique, stressful habitat because of how dynamic it is. And therefore it has also begotten uh, incredible biodiversity. So the creatures that live here are quite unique um, because of adaptations to living in the harsh salt marsh environment. Uh, another thing I'd like you to note from this figure is not just that there are many species and subspecies that are found only in tidal marshes, or endemic to tidal marshes. But if you look at tidal marshes represented here by the dark colors along the coast, obviously, here on the eastern seaboard of the US and Canada, we have a large proportion of the global extent of salt marshes. And then these pie charts show the species that are unique to tidal marshes. So we also have a very large share of that global population. So what that means is that here in the Eastern US and Canada, we have a huge responsibility for conserving these habitats and the wildlife that call them home that are specially adapted to this habitat. And it also means that the changes we make here directly affect global biodiversity. 
So one of these critter critters, who's the star of the show tonight, is the salt marsh sparrow. Um, oh gosh, and actually I forgot to update this. It has undergone a name change recently for any birders in the audience. Um, I it's Emma Spiza cauticuta. You need agreement between genus and species, but formerly Amadramus cauticutus, as you may know it. So the salt marsh sparrow was actually considered one species with its sister species, the Nelson sparrow. They were together called the sharp-tailed sparrow until the 1990s, and they were split into two species. And then in 2018, they were reclassified. The genus was reclassified as Amospiza. So that's where the two name changes come from over time. Salt marsh sparrows are found or breed only between Maine and Virginia. And then they are short distance migrants who go to the southeastern US and Gulf Coast. Uh, they're wild little critters, uh, little brown birds, and yet they have such interesting breeding ecology. So they have been named the world's most promiscuous bird species because when researchers looked at paternity in nests, they found that in one third of nests, every egg or chick had a different father. Why is that? Because they nest in tidal marshes where they need to nest quickly to successfully breed between the monthly high tide windows. So in less than 26 days, they can go from having no nest to building a nest, soliciting copulation, laying typically four eggs, incubating those eggs, feeding the chicks. Each chick goes from two grams to about 13 grams in about 10 days, times four or sometimes even five chicks in the nest. Point of reference, a female salt marsh sparrow weighs about 19 grams. So she is producing more than her own weight in chick growth. That is a lot of bugs. And the females do it all alone. They are an entirely promiscuous species. There's no pair bond. So the males are just looking to copulate with other females, but the females do all that nesting on their own. So it's really incredible that they're adapted to breed successfully in the rapidly changing tidal marsh. <clears throat> because of that very distinctive breeding ecology, um, salt marsh sparrows and more generally the tidal marshes that they call home are on the front lines of climate change. Because again, they are grasslands that are flooded twice a day by high tides. So sea level in particular is threatening this habitat and salt marsh sparrows. So I just wanted to show you what that looks like from a different angle. Salt marsh sparrows nest up here in the high marsh plain circled in red where they build their nest just a few inches above the ground. Um, here's sort of a, a diagram of what that looks like. And then here's a photograph. They're very well camouflaged. Um, the thought is that they're trading off with predation risk. So there aren't as many predators in the marsh, so the nest is less likely to be predated. But the trade-off is that they have long experienced high rates of nest flooding, particularly at the monthly high tides. So again, as lovers of the marsh, you probably already know that the high tide it means a different thing at a different point in the month. So some high tides are bigger than others. And so uh, salt marsh sparrows are actually adapted, as I said, to fit their whole breeding interval between the highest high tides of the month, um, which happen once every 28 days. And here's what that looks like. So this is a salt marsh sparrow nest. You can see the woven nest cup there. You can see one, two, three, four eggs. And you're about to see a nighttime high tide at that astronomical monthly high tide event. So you can see the eggs are floating up and down. And now the tide's receding. And that's the female incubating the nest again. So even though her eggs were inundated with salt water, the salt marsh sparrow female will return and incubate. We found that they can be um, inundated with salt water at least half a dozen times and still survive as long as the female comes back. So you can really see the mark of this very unique breeding ecology in their breeding phenology or the timing of the breeding season. So each of these horizontal lines is a salt marsh sparrow nest that we found in Maine. And it's as long, it, it's as, long as it was active from discovery until conclusion. The green nests are the successful nests. So you can picture where the high tides came through this season, and you can see that there are these pulses of nesting. Salt marsh sparrow 
females can also nest up to three times in a single season. You can see that there were the most successful nests late in the season when they synchronized to the high tides. And again, <clears throat> it's very interesting ecology, but it all points toward this species being very much threatened by sea level rise. Because as sea level rises, you could picture how this window that they need to successfully breed is going to get shorter and shorter as this line, representing the high tide, creeps upward. So for all of those reasons, uh, a team of researchers known as the Saltmarsh Habitat and Avian Research Program, spanning seven states across the Northeast, got together to look at salt marsh sparrows and other tidal marsh birds with the goal of assessing how are they doing, how will they their populations fare in the future. So our goals were to quantify all of these different metrics. What are the population sizes, the distributions, the trends over first a 10 year time frame, and then we've just run analyses for a 20 year time frame starting around the year 2000. Um, and then, you know, depending on whether their populations are increasing, decreasing, or stable, what's driving it? Is it the reproduction? Is it adult survival? So these were our goals. Here's the salt marsh sparrow, but we had other focal species as well. Again, all tidal marsh endemic species that make the marshes of the Northeast, uh, like Massachusetts home. So the first three metrics, we estimated using point count surveys where we visited 1700 points between Maine and Virginia first in 2011. And we really have done it almost every year since because there have just been a lot of questions to answer. Um, but the first goal was to look at 10 year time intervals for populations. And this is some of the work that Sophie did in the marsh last summer. So I'll turn it over to her to give you a picture of what a day in the field is like and give the results for your own backyard. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, so let's talk about the actual research that was done at uh, Wakoi Bay. Oh, can you go back one? Sorry, Kate. Cool. So Wakoi asked me to come out and specifically look for salt marsh sparrows at their reserve. Well, whether the salt marsh sparrow was present or absent is a super important piece of information or data to collect, but what other data did I collect while I was at Wakoi? Um, SHARP has standardized protocols for how we collect our data. This means we use the same methods to collect habitat data and bird data from every site or point, and this is to reduce bias in our sampling. So, oh, go ahead. Um, we use a standardized protocol to choose where to actually conduct a survey, where to look for these birds. These survey points are coordinates where I walked or kayaked out to, or you could say trudged out to if it was very muddy. Uh, at the bottom here, I included some images of what this looks like. Um, navigating the marsh had to be one of my favorite parts about this summer. Um, so these points were the uh, only location where I collected data on was what birds were present or absent. So at Wakoit Bay, I had five different surveys to conduct, which you can see kind of at the top here, I put a map. This is a satellite view of Wakoit Bay and these stars mark the points in which I conducted a survey. It's important to note that these points are randomly selected, meaning I didn't go out to Wakoit Bay and go to the habitat where I thought I was most likely to see a salt marsh sparrow. Um, what this randomization of survey locations does is once again attempt to eliminate bias towards specific birds or habitats within the marsh. So once I walked or kayaked or trudged through the mud and got to one of these stars on the map, I used a survey method called point counts. So with this method, we get a point or a lat long unit where the surveyor stands and we count literally every bird we see here during a certain time interval usually about five minutes. So I didn't just look for salt marsh sparrows, I took data on every single bird. This includes not only sight identification, but also sound identification. Every bird has a unique call, so I was able to collect data on species that were present, even if I didn't actually see them. Um, some birds are harder to see than others. Some are really great at hiding in the marsh grasses, uh, such as rails, sora, bitterns, but um, some of these species are known to respond to calls from their own species. So I've included a picture here of some of the equipment I brought into the field, including a data sheet where I wrote down the birds that I saw or heard, my binoculars so I can get a better view of the bird, and the speaker 
And what I do with the speaker is I conduct what's called playback portion of my point count, where I play different bird calls on the speaker in an effort to identify those sneakier species. And this is how a point count is done. So in addition to collecting data on the birds present at each of these points, um, it's important to note the composition of the habitat. Salt marshes are composed of several different habitat types, which Kate mentioned, and I also have listed here in this white box. Each has its own unique characteristics that house different types of plants and animals. So what I attempt to do, what I attempted to do at each survey location was to define what proportion of the marsh each of these unique habitat comprises. Um, so I do have a picture of a Coit Bay here and say this was my survey point. I would write down that this point is surrounded by high marsh, which is this area of short green gas, grass that you see. There's also a pan or a shallow pool at the forefront of this image and a channel running through. Um, I can see in the far back, I have deciduous trees, which we characterize as upland or no longer part of the marsh. We also look for invasive species or a non-native species that may or may not cause harm. To um, an example of an invasive species is purple loosestrife, and which you can see in the top right hand picture here is Ryan, one of the stewardship coordinators, uh, kind of just ripped that loosestrife out of the ground and I thought it was hilarious, so I took a picture. Let's look at some of the results from the surveys that I did. Um, here's a pie chart of the proportions of land cover um, that I conducted for the five points. So what are we seeing here? About a quarter of the total area that I covered at Wakoit Bay, my surveys was comprised of invasive plant species. That's this region you see in black. Um, these species include the common reed or Phragmites australis and the purple loosestrife that you saw in the previous slide. We also have a large proportion, um, which is signified in blue, of open water. And if you're familiar with Wakoit Bay, you know that flat pond takes up a huge part of that refuge. As far as the plant species that we typically define to be the low marsh or high marsh, uh, these are represented by the two slivers of green in this pie chart. And it makes about only 20% of the area I covered at Wakoit Bay. Um, so considering we know that these areas in green here are typically where the salt marsh sparrows nest, call, or hang out, how do these habitat type affect the bird species composition, but specifically are salt marsh sparrows still going to be present if there is more land covered with invasives than with marsh grasses? So let's look at the results. Uh, as it turns out, the salt marsh sparrow is actually the most abundant species that I found at the reserve. So this is a graph showing the results from my five point counts. Oops, sorry. Um, the y-axis displays abundance or the average number of birds at each survey point, and the x-axis clarifies the species name using a four-letter code. Um, you can go to the next slide, and it's ranging from the most abundant species on the left to the least abundant species that I saw on the right. So as evidenced by this plot, we had an average of about six individual salt marsh sparrows per survey point. Um, you can move on to the next slide. So these aren't my pictures, but I did want to point out that despite the somewhat low proportion of marsh grass cover, the resilience of these guys is quite amazing. I remember actually seeing salt marsh sparrows landing on these invasive reeds, taking advantage of that habitat to call out to potential mates. Um, here's an example. The top right hand, sorry, top left hand picture here is a little salt marsh sparrow flying without a tail. Um, as I hope you can see, it's quite a special and charismatic little bird. So let's look at some of the other species, uh, most abundant species that I saw in my point counts. Um, do you wanna go to the next slide? And the next one. So here you can see uh, we have a double crested cormorant, which is not exclusively a marsh bird, but a really unique fish eating water bird that you will see year round in Cape Cod. And that was the next most abundant bird. And you can skip about three slides ahead. 
This is a, another very abundant bird that I encountered during my surveys. It's the common yellow throat. Um, common yellow throats tend to use the marsh edges and have this very beautiful and distinctive song. It goes witchity, witchity, witchity. And so I actually ended up hearing these birds more frequently than I saw them. And I could definitely sit here and talk for the rest of the time about the birds that I saw at Wakoit, but I'm just going to highlight some of the other most abundant species that I saw. Um, and once again, these are not necessarily our focal species or the endemic marsh birds. Some of these species such as the American Robin and the European Starling are very widely distributed and able to occupy a vast amount of habitats. Other birds like the red-winged blackbird are almost only seen in marshy or brushy habitats because this is where they prefer to nest. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass the presentation back over to Kate, and I'll wait to take questions at the end. Thanks. Um, so as Sophie described, the one half of shark consists of these point counts where we went to many, many, many places in the marsh between Maine and Virginia um, a few times and recorded all of the birds that could be detected by sight or sound. The other half of shark to get at the um, questions of, all right, if their populations are doing poorly, say, why is it? Is it that the nest survival is low or the adult survival is low? And what is their population going to look like in a number of years? That half of SHARP consists of demographic surveys. So instead of going to many places a few times in the summer, we would go to a few places shown here in the black boxes many times. So these are plots where we would search for nests, monitor the nests once we found them to uh, determine whether they succeeded or failed. If they failed, why? Was it flooding or depredation? We also used mist nets to capture adults to estimate adult survival. So at these study plots of which we've had, you know, usually about 20 some per year between Maine and uh, New Jersey or sometimes Virginia, uh, a field crew would be at the same site once every three days so that we could track those nests accurately. And for that, the work was more detailed, um, but we still wound up with quite a large sample size. Uh, so this is just the first few years worth of data, but we had over 2,500 salt marsh sparrow nests. Uh, and that's just in the first three years. I actually just finished migrating the demographic data for all of SHARP from we had a few, so SHARP primarily began in 2011, but one of our collaborators had some data from 2000 to 2010. But the data that we have in the database is now 2000 to 2023, and it is over 126,000 records of tidal marsh birds, their nests, where they're found, whether they succeeded or failed, adult captures. We captured over 10,000 unique salt marsh sparrows um, over the last, 15 years. Uh, so we wound up with a very fortunately large sample size to really dig into those population trends and figure out the mechanisms by which these tidal marsh birds were succeeding or not. So now I'll go over some of the big picture results that we found from this shark project, both the point count side and the demographic side. These results cover the entire range, Maine to Virginia. Um, and starting with the uh, population sizes were about what we pictured. Um, unfortunately, we did see declines in several species. So uh, salt marsh sparrows we found were declining at a rate of 9% annually between the year about 1998 and 2012. Um, and that doesn't sound so bad, but it, it's a matter of going from about 200,000 individuals in 1998 to about 60,000 in 2012. So that is a big loss. Looking broadly across all of the tidal marsh birds that we detected a lot of, we found that the more specialized a species was to the tidal marsh, the sharper the declines. So salt marsh bears were exhibiting the greatest declines. They spent their entire life cycle in the tidal marsh, whereas a species like the willet that is less restricted to the tidal marsh uh, was not experiencing negative population trends. Digging into salt marsh sparrows alone, we found evidence of some mechanisms. So at points, like the ones where Sophie visited, where there were no tidal restrictions downstream of that spot in the marsh, 
Those are illustrated by this line, and we actually saw no negative population trend at those sites that did not have altered hydrology. But where a site had one to four tidal restrictions, something like a culvert under a road, we saw a decline and an even sharper decline where there were four or more restrictions. So this is evidence pointing toward human modification of the hydrology or how the water comes in and out of a tidal marsh leading to population declines for salt marsh sparrows. We dug into the mechanisms by looking at their reproductive success and we found that uh, nest survival is really variable across the salt marsh sparrow range. So we've got latitude on the x-axis here. So you can see at our sites from New Jersey up to Maine, and there's some duplication among years here. So you can see a lot of variability. You have sites very close to each other within a kilometer or two of each other can have very different reproductive success. We found that uh, Salt marsh sparrow adult survival did not really vary across the range and was not at an alarming rate. So when you put together reproductive success and adult survival, you can estimate the uh, population growth rate and predict where that population is going to be in 10 years, 20 years, et cetera. So we found that in general, salt marsh sparrow populations were not declining. Again, this is consistent with the point count data where we found that they had declined 9% annually over the course of a, a little over a decade. And it's really reproductive success that is driving these uh, strong declines. So again, if you remember back to their breeding ecology, they can fit their entire breeding cycle between those once a month high tides, but sea level rise is shortening the window. And that's exactly what our research showed is that basically, if you look at the year into the future on the x-axis, and up here you demonstrate there is a window big enough, long enough for the salt marsh sparrows to uh, breed, so at least 23 days, basically it just drops off because of sea level rise. So unfortunately, we're predicting that the salt marsh sparrow will be extinct by 2060 at the rate things are going. And this chart project originally started as a two to three year project, two years for point counts, three years for the demographic work. We had answered our questions. We figured out how these populations were doing, where they were found, uh, what they were gonna look like in a number of years. And then in year two of our study, Hurricane Sandy rolled right through the middle of our study range. It was obviously devastating to human infrastructure, billions of dollars worth of damage. And it set us up to look at the effect of a dramatic event like a hurricane on tidal marsh bird populations. I mean, there were huge changes to the marsh, barrier beaches blown out, marshes covered with sand. So one would reasonably expect that tidal marsh birds like salt marsh sparrows would be disrupted. But actually we found quite the opposite. Even though human infrastructure sustained billions of dollars worth of damage, the birds were just fine. And their reproductive success was comparable after Hurricane Sandy compared to before Hurricane Sandy. So I think this is a lesson that we can learn from, which is that tidal marshes are a naturally dynamic habitat and a, an acute event like a hurricane that might look like a stressor to us, might look like it's very disruptive to the habitat is actually part of what that habitat is built for, shaped for, and is naturally able to withstand, including the wildlife that live there. Instead, it's the chronic stressor of sea level rise that's taxing salt marsh sparrow populations and other tidal marsh birds. So acute stressors like hurricanes, it's okay. Not all disturbances are bad. It depends on what the habitat and the wildlife is used to. But the acute stressor of sea level rise is what's really spelling trouble for our tidal marsh bird populations. Following Hurricane Sandy, there is a large investment by our government in uh, resilience and tidal marsh restoration. So that has been what the SHARP project has been looking into in the last few years. So again, it started as a two or three year project. We're now in about year, I don't know, 13, 14, because stuff like Hurricane Sandy's come up. Um, so we have for the last seven years been using point counts and demographic studies to look at restoration projects and how effective they are. So many restoration projects were funded by that congressional allocation following Hurricane Sandy. These projects take a number of different forms. So sometimes they're adding sediment or planting. Sometimes they're putting in 
excuse me, protection um, against wave action like living shorelines. Sometimes they're altering the hydrology. This could mean uh, widening a culvert that's too small or removing a culvert entirely. So we have been, again, using both point counts and demographic data to assess that. We are in the process of uh, analyzing those data now. And in the meantime, some lessons that we've learned include that there's such variation on the small local scale in tidal marshes that I think it makes it really important for us to identify those areas and protect them. So Wakoit Bay had a really high salt marsh barrow density. That tells you that you've got this nice little patch of good habitat. It's worth protecting. Whereas some sites that are next door that are experiencing low reproductive success might be good targets for restoration. So one of many important lessons we've learned to help us prevent the extinction of the salt marsh sparrow is hold tight to the, those sites that are doing well, like Wakoit Bay. And I'll turn it over to Sophie. So the last thing I wanted to cover um, here is how you as the audience can also get involved in this research. Community science projects and databases are platforms that allow everyone to make observations about the world around them and contribute to all types of scientific research, um, including salt marsh re research. So now there's a multitude of community science websites and apps out there that I would highly recommend you check out, but the two that I'm going to go briefly over are iNaturalist and eBird. So eBird is an app and a website that allows you to document the bird species you observe when you're out and about. So whether you are specifically taking a walk with the intention of bird watching, or if you happen to see a red-tailed hawk fly over you, um, with eBird you can tr contribute to bird population research by just submitting a list of the birds you see at a specific location in time. With eBird, we don't have to rely on me, one field technician, going out and surveying the marshes of Cape Cod for salt marsh sparrows, but we can work together to track where and when the species is seen. A similar application to eBird is iNaturalist. However, instead of making observations only on what bird species you see, you can observe all types of species and families such as plants, fungi, fish, insects. Um, with iNaturalist, you don't have to know the exact species you observe. Um, you can just take a picture and there are experts that go in and check your observations and can identify your plant or animal for you. So here I inserted a map of Cape Cod and each of these blue dots is a community scientist observation of a salt marsh sparrow. So with this data, we can still answer critical questions about the habitat and marsh bird distribution of the Northeastern United States from a much larger sample of observers. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you to those who funded this project and also um, everybody who's contributed to it. So these are some of the researchers who've been involved over the past few years, but I want to spend the most time on this slide, which is um, these are field techs from just my sites in southern Maine for a few years. So multiply this times at least seven states times at least three or four different sets of three years. Uh, if you see a birder under 35, I have a feeling they've worked for sharp. Um, so you might want to ask them about it, and they probably know a lot about salt marsh sparrows. And we wouldn't be anywhere without all of their hard work and many top overs of their boots. Um, so thank you to everybody who's contributed. Lastly, Sophie and I will be happy to take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sophie and Kate. And um, yes, some people have already started putting some questions into the chat box. And Lori, do you want to do the first question for us? Or do you want me to? Yeah. I, I, no, that's okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> it looks it looks like the first question is for Sophie. Um, did you collect plant abundance data at the same time as point count bird surveys? And what did these plant abundance surveys look like? A great question. No, I separated these. So um, the way that sharp point counts work is that you go to a site twice 
And the second time I went to that site is when I characterized the plant community or that habitat land cover community. And what I did was after I completed or possibly before I completed a bird survey, I looked within a certain meter radius of me. I believe it was 100 meters. And I was able to say, okay, what proportion of the 100 meter radius away from me is low marsh? What proportion is open water? What proportion is high marsh? And these different types of marshes, as well as upland um, differential uh, ways to define the marsh are actually characterized by what plant species are there. So for example, low marsh and high marsh are filled with Spartina alterniflora and Spartina patens. And so the uh, unique species of that plant kind of tells you what sort of habitat you have. And we also did other surveys, which I didn't even get to talk about in this uh, presentation, which were transects. Um, so plant transects are for, um, it works well for organisms that don't move and you kind of go along a line and every X amount of meters in that line, you characterize what plant species um, is right under you. So what we did, is we use a wooden rod, I dropped it every X amount of meters and whatever that rod touched, I wrote down what plant species was there. And so that was another way we characterized what plants were in the marsh. But great question, thank you for asking. Thank you, Sophie. All right, um, Megan Terrell, who's our research coordinator, just had a comment. She said, um, there is a tidal restriction between Flat Pond, where five of Sophie's points are, versus Doghead Marsh, the marsh to the west of Flat Pond. So just a point of clarification there. And then the next question is, are habitat declines as a result of shore deterioration at all attributed to housing developments near marshes on the Cape? So tidal, so there are increasing signs pointing toward um, problems in tidal marshes being driven by not enough sediment supply. So if you think about them, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna pull up Google Earth just so I can show this. Um, salt marsh or salt marshes typically are inundated by- um, Are you gonna like, share the screen? Did you wanna share yes. this? It'll just take me a minute. So I'll keep talking while I do it. Okay. Um, so they typically get sediment from both the upland from sediment that's being carried down by rivers because many tidal marshes are at the mouth of a river as well as sand when the high tide comes in from that marine influence. And so when you build houses on barrier islands and you don't let the sand move, that means that you're starving the marsh of the sediment that it needs to grow vertically. Tidal marshes can actually grow vertically or subside to keep up with sea level rise. But the problem is we're just changing the sea level too quickly for them to keep up and we're not supplying them with enough sediment while we do it. Um, so that's where housing I think comes into play uh, most is that it's just disrupting that natural dynamicism of the habitat that it needs to persist. So let's see, I'm gonna pick on one region, we'll see if, I guess you could probably see um, where it is. So this shows, first of all, you could definitely see probably some of these houses are on old marsh and you've got this whole barrier beach where it would be washing sand into the marsh behind. But what it's done instead is um, built houses on top of it, which is hard at the edge. So directly displacing the marsh. I'll look for a better example where there is still marsh behind it. Um, but you can imagine how that sand's not moving because we've put houses there. Uh, here's a good one. So you've got marsh here and normally this sand would be able to wash over into the marsh to nourish it. But because you've built houses here and people wanna protect the properties and they don't want their homes under the water, that's not gonna happen. We move sand around to nourish the beach to prevent flooding, et cetera. Okay. okay. Looks like another question. Um, given your finding of greater south abundance in areas with less tidal restriction, what do you make of EFRIC, 
et al. 2015 in restoration ecology, having found that tidal restoration didn't benefit sows, abundance, or breeding? That's a great question. So that was in Connecticut, and they looked at sites where uh, marsh had been tidally restricted. It was undersized, so not enough salt water was coming in to maintain the salt marsh. So it was fresher than it should have been. Phragmites australis, which can tolerate more brackish, less salty conditions, had moved in so that when they restored the tidal flow and more salt water came in, I, the frag died back, which was one of their intended goals, but it's been found in a number of marshes that Phragmites, so tall, so different from the native Spartina alterniflora, um, changes the sediment because it has all these rhizomes. And basically when the salt water gets back in, the sediment slumps. And so I believe those marshes had been basically stands, monocultures of Phragmites. And then when the salt water flow was restored, the sediment kind of slumped. And rather than high marsh go lower, low marsh went in because the ground or sediment level was now lower. So I think it's an important lesson that you really need to think through restoration actions. They can have some surprising effects. You need to test them, consider them locally and consider what all the local stressors are. And then you need to do the research to figure out whether they're actually working. Um, because you would think that restoring salt water to the marsh would be a good thing, but it isn't always that straightforward. And that isn't to say that it's not the right decision in some places. It totally is. But you just need to really think it through. Sorry, Lori. That's okay. I'm just going to say thank you for that. So I have to say on mine, it says something about, um, like, due to the large number of participants, um, the mess some messages have been disabled or something. So if there's anybody who we, we didn't read your question out, Lori, I don't know if you can see any more. If there's anyone that we didn't read your question out, you know, if you can try putting in the chat again, or I guess you could, you know, if you know how to raise your hand or something. Um, Cause do you see that message, Lori? That's what I'm seeing, unless you see any other. I'm gonna give you something from Megan. Love your long-term data set and how many sows you found at Webner, exclamation point. What would you like to see for a flat pond management? Okay, good. Okay, do you have input here? I, oh, no. I can... I'll let you take it, Sophie. <laughs> um, from what I remember at flat pond, I remember um, there being, it being quite surrounded by not only typha or cattails, but also phragmites. Um, and there was not much of that low and high marsh there. However, I do remember that some of the points that I went out to, there's just like this little, little chunk of that marsh grass, that Spartina or Alterniflora. And with that marsh grass, I was seeing those sparrows. Um, and so I guess my only, um, and I'm not an expert on habitat restoration, but my only input there is make sure that those small little clumps of that low marsh are being protected as best as you can because salt marsh bears are breeding there. The SHARP project has found quite a few sites that you would look at and think this is terrible habitat for salt marsh sparrows and they're surprisingly productive. So one site I spent several years at in Southern Maine is severely tidal res tidally restricted. It's mostly the low marsh grass, not the high marsh grass. Um, it gets very waterlogged. So if there's a big rain, it'll be, you know, too wet for the salt marsh sparrows, but because it's severely tidally restricted, it dampens the effect of the high tide. So they actually experience really high reproductive success there. Uh, it also smells terrible, um, but it's great habitat for the birds. And so I think, again, it points to, you need to do the research to know how they're doing before you take any action and have an open mind about it. This is not what a lot of habitat managers want to hear. A lot of times, especially when you're thinking on a broad regional scale, people wanna know what's the species that we need. What can I see from satellite imagery that will tell me this is good habitat? But we've seen a lot of evidence that it's very variable over a small spatial scale. Um, 
So fight hard for those sites that might not look like ideal habitat, but where the birds may be doing well. And um, I've heard the analogy, like those little card puzzles that have um, spots for nine little squares and then one's missing and you move it around. Um, I've heard that used for restoration and population management where when a square is in the right spot, leave it alone and do your work <laughs> with other ones, you know, where maybe the, the populations are not doing well. And it's okay if that square that's in the right spot doesn't meet your definition of what good habitat looks like if the population is doing well there, but protect it, leave it alone, and then work on the subpar squares that aren't quite in the right spot yet. And this uh, question kind of relates to what you just said. So how can we possibly delay the inevitable, well, she said, inevitable distinction, extinction of salt marsh sparrows? So sea level rise is really the only the most recent affront to tidal marshes. They have, humans have a long combative history with marshes. It's even in our language, you can be bogged down at work or swamped. We have negative feelings about tidal marshes. In any journey narrative movie, when they're in the wetland, it is not a good time. Thanks Star Wars, <laughs> thanks Lord of the Rings. A lot of negative feelings about wetlands. Um, and we've we've committed many sins there. We've changed the hydrology, we've raised, we've turned them into cultural land. Uh, we've directly developed them with houses, et cetera. So we can address a lot of those other factors that are leading to tidal marsh degradation um, on a local scale. That said, sea level rise marches on. So we need to consider, and people are doing restoration, like adding sediment to the top of marshes. Um, and it's not just good for the birds and the other critters that live there, it's shoreline protection. So in New York City, following Hurricane Sandy, there were proposals to build tidal marshes fringing the city for that um, sort of uh, buffering effect that tidal marshes have against flood tides, billions of dollars. And guess what? New York City used to be fringed by tidal marshes, but we built on top of them. So it's going to cost us billions of dollars to put back what was already there. So preserve the habitat that we have left. Think out of the box for restoration. Fund it. Um, and um, possibly we're headed toward captive breeding, who knows, um, but that's the route they've gone with grasshopper sparrows um, down toward the Southeast. And I know their breeding has been, become successful in captivity in recent years. Okay, um, we have another question, um, I think from, I'm gonna say Alex, yes. Um, thank you for the answer on restoration. Uh, another question, what does Sharp know about the status of SALs being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act? Last I checked in December, the decision deadline had been pushed back yet again. The last I heard is that we should have the decision by fall of 2024. So the committee that did the species status assessment made their recommendation and it's going through the various levels, I think, of um, examination. And then the service on the whole should make their recommendation in the fall, I believe. But one nice thing is that we've already seen that salt marsh sparrows are imperiled. And there is a lot of um, political will and funding um, toward going toward tidal marsh birds like salt marsh sparrows and tidal marsh restoration. So we've been working on restoration projects and I know of more than two dozen restoration projects that are currently underway to some degree just in Maine. And I was just on a call looking at tidal marsh restoration in Massachusetts a couple days ago. So the good news is that no matter what the federal decision is, there's already a lot of people who for whom salt marsh sparrows and tidal marshes are tightened on their radar as important in the coming years. Well, here's a, a question from Ryan Clark. Do sows nest specifically in Spartina patens, the high marsh grasses, or will they nest in other plant species? They mostly nest in Spartina patens, but we've seen them use alternate flora. We've seen them use a little bit of IVA. Um, the general wisdom is that they need patens. Again, we have found some funny sites like that one I surveyed in Southern Maine where it is actually mostly Spartina flora, which is the low marsh. And I actually think that's why salt marsh sparrows did so well there is that alternative flora is taller than patents. And I think just by merit of the veg being taller, the birds built their nests kind of higher up. And that was a good thing in terms of avoiding the flooding at the um, 
at the monthly high tide. So primarily patents, but again, it's good to keep an open mind and actually do the homework for your site to figure out if that's really what they're using there. Okay. I think, Joan, I think that wraps up the questions and I, that's all yeah. I have. Yeah, that's all I, I can.